When President Lincoln took office in March of 1861, the Civil War was already underway. Seven states had seceded, and the bombardment of Fort Sumter would soon begin. Treasury Secretary Salmon Chase estimated that he needed $320 million to meet the Union's expenses for the first year of the war. He had on hand less than $2 million. Secretary Chase frantically set up plans to borrow $150 million from banks in New York, Philadelphia, and Boston. The banks, of course, thought that he would be willing to accept deposit credit like any other borrower would. But they had forgotten one small detail. The U.S. was still under the independent treasury system. This meant a complete separation of bank and state. Some might have been tempted to cheat on that arrangement, you know, during a war. But Chase turned out to be quite a scrupulous fellow. He politely informed the banks that he couldn't legally accept their offer of credit and he let them know to what address they could mail the $150 million worth of gold coin. If you've watched the previous episodes in this series, you'll know that the banks must have thought Chase was out of his mind. All the banks in the whole country couldn't have paid that much gold. After the California gold rush, there was a lot of gold in U.S. bank vaults, but not quite that much. It would have bankrupted them. Banks had to keep a large gold reserve in case depositors asked for it back. And most banks didn't hold enough gold on hand to redeem even a third of the notes they put in circulation. So giving all their gold away to the federal government wasn't an option. Even giving away half of their reserves would probably put them out of business. But Chase insisted. They ended up working out a compromise to make the payments in a series of installments. As the government spent the first installment, the banks hoped that whoever got them would turn around and deposit them again at a bank for safekeeping. At that point, the banks could recycle the same coins, loaning them out to the federal government again and again. It would have been a lot easier to do away with the independent treasury, but whatever. The installment plan worked for a while, But 1861 didn't go well for the Union, as you might know. People started to lose confidence in both the government and the banking system, so they started to hoard gold. That meant the coins weren't recycling back to their vaults as the banks hoped. They were forced to suspend specie payments on December 30th, 1861. Secretary Chase tried to borrow more money from abroad, but that wasn't really much of an option. Chase asked Great Britain for help. Britain had already abolished slavery in 1833, and most people there weren't a big fan of the Confederate South, but they did rely on cotton imports as stock for their textile industry. So the British Empire, unfortunately, decided to stay out of this one the Union wouldn't be getting any loans from them anytime soon. Meanwhile, the prospect for a quick war was fading with each Confederate victory. The Union's advantages in industry and manpower would triumph in the long run, but in 1861 and 2, General Lee's tactical brilliance overwhelmed Union armies on the battlefield time and time again. Lincoln needed more money and Chase racked his brain to figure out a way to supply it. Chase's first recommendation was for a complete overhaul of the nation's banking system. The Civil War is sometimes called the first modern war in world history, as it made full use of railroads and the telegraph for long-distance communication. But in terms of finance, it was a completely different situation. The Union was stuck with a banking system decades out of date. At the start of the war, there were over 1,300 banks nationwide. Each one 
printed their own paper currency. Some of these banks were well capitalized, some not so well, and others were complete frauds without a dime in reserves. To top it off, there were also hundreds of forgeries circulating too. Every business in the country needed banknote detector manuals to tell the good bills from the forgeries and the solid banks from the frauds. And even the good bills would normally get less valuable the further it was away from its bank of issue. Because to get your gold, you had to actually travel to the bank in question. Dealing with all of this was an impossible situation. On top of this difficulty was the major problem that the government couldn't borrow from the nation's own banks, lest they be put out of business as we've already seen. The U.S absolutely needed a national bank, but Andrew Jackson still loomed large in the national consciousness. It was politically impossible. So instead of one national bank, Secretary Chase suggested a system of national banks. This completely new banking system would create a single paper currency to replace the old state banknotes which he suggested should slowly but surely be taxed out of existence. Side note, the state banks challenged this tax on their banknotes, of course, and the case made it all the way to the Supreme Court in 1869 with VZ Bank v. Fenno. The court sided with the government and the decision was read by the Chief Justice. Guess who? Secretary Chase! You're Chief Justice now? Well, that's convenient. That thing you did, you think it was legal? Well, okay then, case closed. I'm kidding. He actually had a pretty good argument for it, based on Congress's power to regulate the money supply. Without this power to restrain the circulation of money, indeed, the attempts of Congress to secure a sound and uniform currency for the country must be futile. Chase's new banking system would also change the way reserves work. Instead of note issue being limited by the amount of gold and silver in bank vaults, it would now be limited by the amount of U.S. bonds in bank vaults. The notes and the bonds would still be redeemable for gold, but just having gold alone wouldn't mean they got to print more banknotes anymore. They needed to buy bonds for that now, which weren't always available. While the Treasury would offer a dollar of new gold certificates for every dollar's worth of gold deposited with them, overall, this design led to an inflexible currency, a flaw which would ultimately prove fatal for Chase's national banking system, as we'll get to in the next episodes. But in 1863, the national banking system was a huge step forward out of the Jacksonian era. The new banking system created a single national currency for the first time ever. Even Hamilton never accomplished that feat. And while the independent treasury wasn't completely abolished yet, it was made more or less obsolete by the National Bank Act. Going forward, the government could actually borrow from the new national banks without putting them out of business. This new banking system took a few years to get going, but back in December of 1861, it was pretty clear the Union didn't have years to wait. President Lincoln and the Union Army needed money, and they needed it now. Fortunately, Secretary Chase had a few more cards to play. He instituted two new taxes to help with the war effort. The first was an internal revenue tax, and the second is one you'll recognize the income tax. It was progressively structured, with the top rate being 10% on all income over $10,000 a year, which was a lot back then. But there was a reason they never tried this before, because the income tax was totally unconstitutional at this time. They finally got called on it in 1894, and the income tax was struck down. But in the middle of a war, the courts will apparently let you get away with anything. But even so, Secretary Chase knew it would take time to raise money through taxes. So what did he do? 
Before I tell you, I have to say first that Secretary Chase was a hard money man. All respectable people were hard money people. He believed gold was the only legitimate monetary foundation. But he also played his last card because he had to, you know, as a stopgap before these others could take effect, even though he was morally opposed to it. You know what it is. The same thing we always do in an emergency. Yes, he printed money. These were called United States notes or greenbacks because they had a green back. But the idea is basically identical to the continental currency used during the Revolutionary War. There's essentially no difference. It's 100% paper money. $150 million worth of greenbacks were authorized by Congress in February of 1862. But they already needed another $150 million by July of 62. And finally, another $150 million was printed in 1863. So now we get to talk about inflation. By the time the first greenbacks went into circulation, prices had already increased by 10%, and it didn't slow down from there. By the end of the war in 1865, prices had doubled. But look, this didn't have that much to do with the paper money per se, because as we know, banks had been printing paper money this whole time. Inflation always seems to happen in wartime because so much of the nation's product is diverted to the war effort. And yes, more money is also pumped into the economy as well. So inflation is boosted by both sides of that. One more thing about greenbacks. If you've watched the previous episodes in this series, you'll know that printing money was unconstitutional at this time. This action by Chase as Treasury Secretary was challenged twice, both times making it to the Supreme Court. The first case was Hepburn v. Griswold, where Chase, as Chief Justice, siding with the majority, rebuked his own actions and that of Congress in making greenbacks a legal tender. The Legal Tender Act of 1862 said that people couldn't refuse to be paid in greenbacks, even if they preferred gold. But it was struck down with this decision in 1870. Then, just the next year, the Supreme Court reversed its stance on money printing, making it legal for the first time with Knox v. Lee. You gotta give Chase credit for his honesty. He continued to argue that his actions as secretary were essentially illegal, by drafting the minority opinion in this case. But Congress's power to create and regulate the value of money was extended to paper with this decision, and it remains that way to this day. Greenbacks were essential to funding the Civil War, but all of the excess money that was pumped into the economy did contribute to some significant inflation. After the war, this led the creditors of the country to ponder. How do you stuff the toothpaste back in the tube? Mm. Is it possible to undo all that war inflation? This is important because if you're holding government bonds, you don't want to be paid back with inflated dollars. We were totally off the gold standard during and after the Civil War and we couldn't get back on it again until all this inflation was removed from the system. So the bankers and other creditors decided they would squeeze and squeeze the whole country until the currency was as good as gold once more. But the people don't like to be squeezed. They had other ideas, and a populist revolt was brewing. Thanks for watching. If you like this video, why not hit the like button? And if you want to help me make more videos like this, you can become a patron at www.patreon.com slash AthensPoliticsNerd.